Hello and welcome to Travels Through Time, the podcast made in partnership with Unseen Histories. It's Violet Moller here. Today we're going back to one of the most famous years in English history. In 1558, John Knox published his book, The Monstrous Regiment of Women, a misogynistic polemic in which he ranted that to promote a woman to bear rule is repugnant to nature. In the very same year, Elizabeth I ascended to the throne of England at the age of 25. This was the kind of bigotry the new young queen was up against as only the second female ruler of England after her sister Mary, who she succeeded. There was a lot at stake. Elizabeth spent the early years of her reign carefully establishing her authority and delicately balancing the complex political and religious issues that had caused so much turbulence in previous decades. Fortunately, Elizabeth was uniquely qualified to tread this tightrope. Not only was she brilliantly intelligent and well-educated, her extraordinary and often bleak childhood had taught her exactly how to navigate the choppy waters and murky currents of the Tudor court. We have a wonderful guide on our tour of these dramatic events. The multi-talented, best-selling author, historian and broadcaster, Tracy Borman, whose latest book, the one we will be talking about today, is Crown and Scepter, A New History of the British Monarchy, William the Conqueror to Elizabeth II. Tracy has presented a number of history programmes for Channel 5, including The Fall of Anne Boleyn and Inside the Tower of London. She's a regular contributor to BBC History magazine and gives talks on her books across the country and abroad. Welcome to Travels Through Time, Tracy Borman. Thank you for having me. I'm very excited. Uh, Me too, because I know that today we're in for a real treat because we are going to be talking about our favourite queen. We share the same favourite queen, and that is, of course, Elizabeth I. Easily the best monarch we've ever had, I would would say. I would Um, support that 100%. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, And perhaps we can go into that in a bit more detail later. But before we do, can you just tell us a bit about yourself? Because you have a fascinating career and um, your CV is extremely impressive. So can you tell our listeners... Um, a bit about what else you do apart from writing books. Yeah, sure. Well, thank you. Um, I'd like to say it was all very carefully planned from the off my career, but it's kind of um, evolved uh, in a sometimes chaotic way. But I feel very, very lucky to do what I do because basically I, I work in history in a number of different forms. So as well as writing books, um, I am also a broadcaster. I present uh, history documentaries, um, give talks on history. And I have a kind of day job, uh, which is as joint chief curator for historic royal palaces. So I get to call Hampton Court my office, which is kind of nice. And I like to boast about it whenever I can. (laughs) As a Tudor historian, it doesn't get much better than that. Um, And we look after six royal palaces that uh, also include the Tower of London and Kensington Palace. So I would say that all of the various uh, sort of jobs that I do are, are very complementary. They all involve history. Uh, they tend to involve being in very old buildings. Um, and even at home, I like to surround myself uh, with history. I'm currently in my study and very close to my study door uh, is my dog Cromwell, uh, who may make his presence felt uh, at some stage. Wonderful. And how did you, you know, how, how what was the path that took you to where you are now? Did you start off writing or did you start off working in the material culture? What, what, what was the route? Well, um, I actually started off uh, knowing nothing more than that. I just wanted to study history. I just always loved history. Um, and uh, when I was doing my A-levels, I went to see a careers advisor and I remember the conversation so clearly um, because they said to me, look, 
forget it. You can't have a career in history. Um, just have it as a hobby. So I went to university to study it rather dejectedly thinking, well, this will just be a hobby. And then it kind of grew from there. And um, how it started was that I volunteered in historic sites. So I dressed up as a Victorian jailer at Lincoln Castle, uh, my hometown. Um, I got various other voluntary positions. And then I started out um, in paid work once I'd finished my PhD and really got any job I could at any level in heritage. So it was my heritage career uh, that really came first. But I always loved writing, um, you know, from very, very early on. I've kept a diary since I was eight years old. Um, I still keep it religiously every day. I just love writing. Um, and so that really came second. Um, and I've probably been writing now for my first book was published in 2007. So 14 years now um, and almost as many books later. Um, and, and now the writing is sort of increasingly taking over, which I have to say is how I like it. And so do you think eventually you'll you'll give up the other stuff and just focus on writing on its own or that's that's. I, I guess I should be careful who's listening to this. <laughs> yeah, maybe that's too personal a question. <laughs> no, I think ultimately I would, I can't imagine ever not writing. I can't, when I look at forward to, uh, I don't mean, you know, look forward in glee to retirement, but when I contemplate retirement, uh, hopefully many years in the future, I can't imagine ever retiring from writing. Uh, so hopefully yeah. that's something that will carry on. Well, it is one of those jobs that you can literally keep on doing until... Yeah, they have to wheel you out of the library <laughs> in a box. <laughs> um, you also write novels. So can you tell us a little bit about your novels? Yeah, I have to say it was a dream come true to start writing fiction because I read historical fiction all the time. And uh, I never really thought that I could write it myself. It's a very different discipline, obviously. Um, but what gave me the idea was when I was writing my history of the witch hunts during the Jacobean period, the early 17th century. And I just thought this is such a dark and dramatic story. And it didn't feel enough to just tell the nonfiction version. I really wanted to dramatize it, to bring it to life, to convey the horror of what these women were going through when they were hunted down um, as witches, um, really completely innocent, um, most of those who, who ended up losing their lives for it. And so that's where the idea for my um, fiction trilogy came from. And yeah, it was, it was such a learning curve, I have to say, because um, even though I read historical fiction all the time, as I say, actually writing it is so different. And showing, not telling was the number one lesson that I learned from my editor, that you don't convey information as you would in nonfiction by just saying, and then this happened, and then this happened. Uh, you have to weave these kind of details into dialogue and, and create scenes. Um, but once I got the hang of it, I, I became utterly addicted and now I love writing fiction just as much as non-fiction I have to say. It must be much more difficult though do you find it much more difficult? I do find it more difficult what I find is I have to be in the mood a lot mm. more than non-fiction is more of a process um, you, you do the research you write it up um, and um, that makes it sound quite dull it's actually not it's No but I guess you've got the facts <laughs> you have the information. And you've then got you the need facts to... yeah just put them into um, some eloquent phrasing and and there you go but, but but with fiction on the one hand it's it's kind of imagining yourself into a situation and and creating the dialogue but but what I really find the challenge um the greatest challenge rather is is the plot side of things because it doesn't come naturally to a historian to make things up. No. Um, and so I, I base my novels on sort of known facts and known characters. But of course, you can't just do that. Otherwise, you might as well write nonfiction. Mm. So I have to embellish. I have to take the reader into places they weren't expecting to go. And, and I think that for me is the biggest challenge, but it's also really exciting. And I have to say, it can be liberating because one of the frustrations of nonfiction is when you really, really want something to be true and you want to find the evidence to support it. And there just isn't. There are big gaps in the sources. But as a novelist, you can fill those gaps yeah. with your imagination. So I have loved it. Um, and today we're going to be talking about your new book, which is uh, nonfiction called Crown and Scepter. Um, and so can you just tell us a bit about the idea for the book? What, what's the sort of um, what was your aim in writing it? And, and how did you get the idea? 
So the idea really came from an awareness um, a couple of years ago that the Queen's Platinum Jubilee was coming up. Mm-hmm. Uh, February 2022, Elizabeth II uh, has will have reigned for 70 years, which is just a phenomenal achievement um, and not one certainly um, echoed by any other monarch in British history. So I thought, wouldn't that be an interesting moment to reflect back um, to s- sort of place Elizabeth II's reign into context, but also just to take a long view of the institution of monarchy, how it has evolved, because it shouldn't still be here. You wouldn't design a monarchy in modern day society. It, it sort of doesn't work in the way that it did when it was first conceived. And yet it is this remarkable survivor. And so many of the facets of the monarchy are unchanged over about 1,080 years, including the the form of words used at coronations and all of the bizarre rituals and pageantry that that surround the crown today. So the book is um, a look at the institution of monarchy, but it also, of course, uh, is about the kings and queens themselves. And and there are some very, very vivid characters uh, within that narrative. I wonder what you, so we're going to be talking about Elizabeth I and um, and I just wonder what you think about um, having looked back across the full stretch of the British monarchy about female rulers. I mean, obviously, you know, our attitude towards female rulers has changed. There's this brilliant quote from John Knox um, from his book, which has the best title of any book I've ever heard. <laughs> the monstrous <laughs> regiment of women. And he, you know, he's, he's basically saying to, to promote a, a, a woman to bear rule is repugnant to nature. And, and that was published in the very year that Elizabeth I acceded <laughs> to the throne. So this is what she's up against. And I, oh, I, just, yeah. I just think that, you know, she was really our first, um, I mean, obviously Mary ruled before her, but, you know, Elizabeth was the first sort of really successful female ruler we had. What 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 do you think about that? Do you think that women, you know, do they do you think they bring something else to positions of power? I, I don't know. What what are your views on that? I I think they do. I think some of our most successful monarchs have been female. Um, I do think it was a game changer with Elizabeth. Now we said at the start we're both big Elizabeth fans, mm. so I'm not just being biased here. I think she changed people's minds about queens because until Elizabeth, it was seen as a total disaster. If you didn't have any male heirs to succeed you and literally, you know, you're really scraping the barrel if if you have to put a woman on uh, the throne. And to be fair, really, to that prejudice that existed, there there were only a couple of examples of female rulers and neither of them had been particularly encouraging. Uh, Elizabeth's half-sister, Mary, uh, with her determination to bring England back to the Roman Catholic fold, with her choice to marry a a, a Spaniard, which was a disaster for a very xenophobic people in the 16th century. And then earlier, you have the Empress Matilda, who plunged the country into civil war. So you, you wrote a book about her as well, didn't you? Matilda. I actually wrote about another Matilda. Oh. They were all called Matilda. It was the wife of William the Conqueror. Oh, okay. Uh, and, and then she kind of made the name Matilda popular and then you just get a whole century of Matildas. But anyway, the Empress Matilda didn't do too good a job of it. But um, so th- there were, really weren't any particularly positive role models for female sovereigns for Elizabeth to draw on, but she broke the mould. She absolutely confounded expectations. She becomes the the longest reigning, I would say, by far the most successful of the Tudor monarchs. And I think it's such a delicious irony Mm. that her father, Henry VIII, uh, you just forgot all about her, really. She was just his younger daughter and never supposed to get anywhere near the throne, goes to all that trouble for a son, all those wives, and it's his daughter, Elizabeth, who does the best. So I do think there was a sea change after uh, Elizabeth. And we didn't exactly welcome queens uh, on the same footing as kings, but we warmed to them a lot more, um, which made it easier for successors such as as Queen Anne, um, another very charismatic, I think much maligned uh, female monarch. We tend to just focus on the fact she was pregnant 17 mm. times, but there was a lot more to her. Then, of course, Queen Victoria. By Queen Victoria's reign, we had well and truly fallen in love with the idea of queens. Um, and I think they, there is something, as you say, that they bring a different quality to it. They, they tend to be 
more pragmatic. Um, I don't want to stereotype too much, but they tend to be less uh, kind of intent on waging war and uh, they, on the whole, are slower to act, mm. more cautious um, but yeah, more pragmatic. And, and that often is to the good. Well, that was her great strength, wasn't it, Elizabeth? Because she was so, she inherited this country, which was really riven in two in, in, on religious terms and had had this sort of awful being pulled and pushed in two directions. And she was brilliant the way she managed to just calm everything down and just be very moderate and very kind of, I guess, in some ways, gentle Her approach was her approach. And do you think at the time people recognised that? Do you think she was appreciated for, for what she was? I think to an extent she was. I think England was desperate for peace by the time she became queen. But I think also she frustrated the more radical sides of the religious divide. Um, she didn't go far enough for the Protestants. She herself was a Protestant, but they wanted her to go further. The Catholics, of course, from the start saw her as, as a heretic and an illegitimate one at that because her mother's marriage to Henry VIII had been annulled shortly before her execution. Um, but I think there was a middle ground. There was a, a sort of middle ground of people who were just heaving a sigh of relief that finally we have a queen who is going to try and find a middle way and be a bit more pragmatic. Now, Elizabeth herself didn't actually say that, that famous quote about not wanting to make windows into men's souls. I think that was actually Francis Bacon, but it neatly summed up her approach. And I think uh, that was the keynote of her reign. Yeah. So we are going to go and visit a specific year in her reign. Um, and I would like you to tell us what that year is going to be, please. So we are going back to the year 1588, probably the most famous year of Elizabeth's long reign. Yeah. Um, and she has been queen for 30 years by this point. So she's 55 years old, which is um, a, a good age in the Elizabethan period. Um, and can you just set the scene for us a bit um, in terms of, the political situation and, and, and her standing in the country. So on the one hand, 1588, um, to look at the sort of rosy um, side of life in Elizabeth's England, as you say, she's been queen for 30 years. And in that 30 years, she has established much greater stability than has existed for much of the Tudor period. Um, because the longer somebody reigns, the more there's a sense of continuity, the more things settle down as a general rule. And Elizabeth is becoming more self-confident as, as a female monarch and also as an unmarried monarch which deeply shocked contemporaries. But she's sort of making a virtue of her virginity. She's creating this cult of the Virgin Queen. So that side of things is looking quite rosy. But just uh, the previous year, 1587, saw one of the most tumultuous events of Elizabeth's entire reign. And that was the execution of her greatest rival, Mary, Queen of Scots. Well, Mary had been a thorn in Elizabeth's side since the beginning of the reign. She'd been a captive in England for nearly 20 years. And there had been numerous Catholic plots aimed at freeing Mary, placing her on the throne, murdering Elizabeth. And one of those plots, the Babington Conspiracy of 1586, came close to succeeding. But it also gave the game away for Mary because Mary had lost patience. She, she was less cautious by then. She wanted to be free. And she struck up this secret correspondence with the conspirators. Walsingham spies were all over it. It condemned Mary. Well, Elizabeth really did prevaricate over the question of, of Mary's fate. She didn't want to execute her. It was setting a very dangerous precedent to execute an anointed queen. But in the end, really, she had no choice. And so Mary went to her death on Elizabeth's orders in 1587. Well, Philip II the King of Spain, um, who I think had had his eyes on being King of England ever since Elizabeth came to the throne. He had, of course, sort of been King of England because he'd been married to Elizabeth's half-sister Mary for, for a few years. Um, and he was determined to use Mary's execution really as an excuse to invade. I think he probably would have wanted to invade anyway, uh, but he made it very, very clear 
uh, that he was going to launch an invasion to avenge Mary, Queen of Scots' death. This great Catholic figurehead. She'd become a Catholic martyr, really. And so England was under the most serious threat that it had faced, I think, really since 1066 and the Norman invasion. Um, So Elizabeth now had to face the music. She had to face the repercussions of her decision to execute Mary, Queen of Scots. And because I know that one of the big issues that people had with female leaders in those days was this whole thing of leading uh, your soldiers into battle because that was, you know, had been early, earlier on the sort of primary role of a king, of a leader. Uh, and was this the first moment when she was sort of faced with actual military action, as it were? Yeah, yeah. It, it was really because Elizabeth famously disliked wars. She made no secret of the fact um, they have uncertain outcomes um, and she preferred to find uh, that typical compromise that she always sought in in most matters. And Elizabeth's um, tactic up until now had been to procrastinate or to seem to anyway. And this is where she was just so brilliant, I think, because she kind of played her male counsellors at their own game because they all thought, oh, she's just a woman. She can't make decisions. And so she turned that back at them and said, you know, like, oh, when, yeah. when pressed to go to war, she said, oh, you can't possibly expect I'm just to a decide woman. this. <laughs> I'm just a woman. Sorry. Can't make decisions. Um, and But now there was no avoiding it. She had the might of Spain bearing down on her country. This is not something that could be delayed or could be ignored. And so she had to steal herself into action. Okay. And so now this is absolutely perfect because this takes us to your first scene, which is Tilbury. I can't remember the exact date, but it is this great moment for her when she really, um, she gives the speech. So, so, so tell us. Yes. Yes. So Tilbury uh, took place actually on the 9th of August, 1588. So the Armada had actually set sail from Spain uh, at the end of May, 1588. Uh, It was first seen off the the coast of England um, in July. um, And there had been a number of engagements with uh, between English ships and and the Spanish ships. And actually the English ships were doing pretty well because they were lighter, they were more manoeuvrable, they were faster. Um, and the, the sort of um, the Achilles heel of the Armada was the fact that Philip II was determined that it should rendezvous with uh, his forces in the Netherlands. So half of the Netherlands were Spanish. Um, he, the Duke of Parma was this great military leader in the Netherlands. And the plan was that uh, the, the Armada that had sailed from Spain would meet up with the Duke of Parma's fleet, and together they would be this invincible invasion force. But it didn't quite work like that. Many ships were lost along the way. They were harried by English ships. That meeting never really did take place. And there was a very decisive um, battle uh, in early August where really uh, the Spanish fleet was not quite decimated, but it was much reduced thanks to the English use of fire ships. Yes. They would send in these fire ships causing chaos and destruction amongst the Spanish fleet. So that had actually happened on the 7th of August. And really, the battle was pretty much won, I have to say, for England at that time. But news didn't travel as fast as it uh, does today. And so Elizabeth didn't know that when she made her famous speech um, in Tilbury on two days later, this was her finest hour, I think we would say, to use a Churchillian phrase. Um, she rode into the midst of the troops that had been gathered at uh, Tilbury to repel what they were sure would soon be this huge Spanish invasion. And she was ever mistress of PR. I think she was the most brilliant propagandist uh, going, probably in royal history, having looked at the whole uh, gamut of, of royal history. And she dressed the part. She uh, she was wearing a plumed helmet and a steel breastplate over her white velvet gown. So she dressed in white so she could be easily seen by her troops. And then, of course, she delivered this show-stopping speech And we have, I think, six different uh, versions of it, but they're all pretty much the same. And of course, the most famous part 
of the speech is when she declares that she is just a a weak and feeble woman. Uh, But then she compares herself to a king of England. She has the stomach of a king, a king of England too, and think foul scorn that Palmer or Spain or any prince of Europe should dare to invade the borders of my realm. And then she basically declares that she will, you know, fight and die alongside you all. So this is you know, an astonishing performance, even by Elizabeth's standard. She's known for her amazing speeches. But here she is. She's got her military inspired uh, outfit on. She gives this rousing speech. All her troops are just cheering and cheering. And they're all now ready. They're ready. The Queen is going to lead them into battle. Of course, the battle's already been won. (laughs) And the Spanish fleet is kind of struggling to make its way around the coast of England and escape really back to back to Spain. But in a sort of way, that didn't really matter. You know, this this was such a moment in in Elizabeth's reign. And it's I think it's rightly seen as one of the defining moments in, in British history. Because all those, you know, people, it was Churchill and, and or our very own Boris Johnson, uh, you know, that, that is exactly <laughs> the kind of speech, that's the kind of rhetoric, isn't it, that, that, that we, we hear again and again. And it's just incredible that she had such a profound understanding of how to inspire and how to also this way of identifying herself with the nation and and that was of course very Mm. clever because she wasn't married so she could really do that she was married to her people just as a nun was married to Christ she was and I mean yeah it's it is brilliant it was just brilliant it was such a a clever use of of imagery that as you say she wasn't married uh, so she was always presenting herself as either sort of married to her people or the mother of her yeah. people. Um, you know, she's married to England. Uh, my people are my children. And this was such a powerful image for people to hold on to. Um, and this really did uh, give her the platform to launch that extraordinary speech at Tilbury. And I think I get quite cross when people sort of downplay it and say, yeah, but the battle had already been won. And, you know, it was just for show it wasn't just for show. Elizabeth wasn't aware that the Armada had effectively been vanquished um, and that she was rising to the challenge. She hated war. She'd never had to do this in 30 years, but she did it absolutely brilliantly. I think Henry V himself couldn't have done no. better at Ashley. Even, <laughs> even with Shakespeare there to help him write the speech. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, <laughs> Um, brilliant. I mean, yeah, it's such a, it's such a powerful image. And then, of course, um, if we can move on to your second scene, um, which is absolutely the image that is that then results from this. So, um, yes. So take us to um, where, where we're going next. The second scene uh, involves paint and canvas, uh, and it was uh, the creation of the world famous Armada portrait probably the most famous portrait of the many we have of Elizabeth. Well, I mentioned that she was amazing at PR and of course she's going to make the most of the victory. Uh, So she had a medal struck uh, celebrating uh, the victory and it was engraved with the words, God breathed and they were scattered. So you know, I think it's kind of the British weather that had helped defeat the Armada. You know, they'd been battered by storms and adverse winds. And so... But that was also, that played very much into this really important idea that Philip thought by sending the Armada, God was going to be with him and, uh, you know, it would be blessed. And then, of course, it wasn't. And and I heard there was some hilarious... Um, was it the Duke of Medina, Medina Sidonia who then wrote back to Philip and said... The, you know the weather's terrible we've we've been destroyed in a storm are you sure god is on our side kind of thing. but that was <laughs> yeah. really important in those days people genuinely it really was it really was there's no such thing as kind of natural phenomena it's all directed by god um and unfortunately yes uh, the uh, well fortunately for for england but uh, unfortunately for philip ii what he had claimed to be this this kind of backed up by God crusade actually turned out to be the exact opposite. And and if 
God was showing his hand, then it was shown very much in, in favor of mm. Elizabeth. Uh, and the Protestant wind blew away the Catholic ships, uh, if you like. And so it sort of backfired that whole uh, kind of imagery that Philip had um had inspired and I, I yes i do love that quote you know are you sure god yeah. on our side it doesn't sound <laughs> doesn't feel like, it like it out here in yeah. the atlantic or wherever they were um exactly. so she has a medal struck and and would this medal have been uh you know who who would have had had these medals who would have they been given to well it was produced in quite large quantities for distribution amongst her sort of high ranking subjects and and to be shown really throughout her kingdom. And of course, um, it bore her portrait. Coins generally tended to be the most effective means of getting your image out to your people. Most people, you know, would have seen coins at some stage. So it was distributed uh, far and wide. Um, and um, it seems to have kind of turned the tide, really, uh, in Elizabeth's image uh, internationally, because, of course, her English subjects are going to be impressed by this, and there's a real feeling of kind of national fervour. But even the Pope declared uh, in the aftermath of the Armada, she is only a woman, only the mistress of half an island, and yet she makes herself feared by Spain, by France, by empire, by all. And you just think, yes, go, yeah, absolutely. Elizabeth. Well, isn't it true <laughs> that England was really a, quite a sort of, was a backwater, especially compared to Spain, which was this enormous superpower yeah. with colonies in South America and you know ships laden with silver and gold coming back across the ocean. Um, so this was a sort yeah. of moment, a, a turning point in our history, I suppose. It really was. You can see the emergence of England as, as a world power from 1588. Already, uh, there's been a degree of, sort of colonization, um, you know, overseas adventurers uh, on Elizabeth's uh, behalf, uh, taking root in the Americas. And so that was stuff. It was very much a fledgling mm. enterprise. But now with the Armada, suddenly uh, the English Navy had proved itself. Elizabeth had proved herself. And this, as I say, is is really the beginning of a new phase uh, in England's standing internationally. That It had gone from just being a bone fought over by the two dogs, Spain and France, which it really had been throughout the Tudor period. And now it was a force to be reckoned with. And so, of course, Elizabeth is going to celebrate this fact uh, with medals and then uh, with, yeah, the, the second moment in time, the commissioning of this famous portrait, which I can't pinpoint a date, but it's likely that the paintbrushes were dusted off pretty soon after Elizabeth got home from Tilbury. Uh, it was probably August or September that the painting was at least started, if not completed. And we don't know who painted it, do we? We don't. Um, for many years, it was believed to be George Gower, um, Elizabeth's sergeant painter, so one of the most important um, artists of the Elizabethan court. Nicholas Hilliard, the, the um, famous miniaturist, is, has also been suggested, but actually recent research by the National Portrait Gallery in London has has discounted both of those quite convincingly, I think. So now, sadly, uh, the, the portrait, and there were three versions of the portrait, by the way, um, are just assigned uh, to an unknown English artist. Um, I don't know why we know it's English, but um, yeah. <laughs> um, and I, I really, I hope we're going to be able to have a copy of it up on your episode page on our website so people can go and have a look, but they can also just Google it. It's very easy to find. So can you just t tell us a little bit about the, the symbolism of it and, and, and describe it and sort of explain it? Mm. Because there's lots of hidden meanings, aren't there? Yeah, there are, there are. So... You know, the obvious message is there as soon as you look at it. There is Elizabeth. Uh, she's front and centre, looking very, very glorious. Um, and in the background, on, on one side of her, you see uh, the Spanish fleet battered by storms. And then on the other side, the English fleet sailing through very calm waters. Um, but then the, the details start to get a bit more interesting. Elizabeth's hand, um, one of her hands is resting on a globe. Uh, below a crown, um, and her fingers cover the Americas, which uh, which indicate England's fledgling uh, empire, really, uh, in the New World. But one of my favourite bits of symbolism actually concerns uh, the pearl that Elizabeth is wearing, uh, which is believed to symbolise 
uh, chastity, but it's also believed that they that pearl may have actually once belonged to Mary, Queen of Scots. And that the idea that Mary is in the portrait is strengthened as well uh, by the presence of a mermaid uh, who was carved on the chair of state that Elizabeth is sitting on. Now she's facing away from the mermaid, and the mermaid uh, was, uh, you know, a typical symbol of, well, really a kind of prostitute almost, of a, of a loose woman, at least we can say. Um, and so it's believed that the mermaid symbolized Mary and then Elizabeth's kind of purity, her virginity is emphasized by the fact she wears a pearl. So uh, she has triumphed over this scarlet woman, this queen of Scots, who has been a it's a thorn in her side for so many years. Um, so there's so much to say about the, the different symbols. They loved to, to give secret messages. They were often quite playful with their uh, symbolism in paintings. And you definitely see that uh, with this incredible uh, work of art that is the Armada portrait. And she's not just wearing one pearl. I mean, there's, there's hundreds no. of pearls dotted Many. around in her hair <laughs> and everywhere. Yeah, there's no doubt that the message she's trying to send there. Yeah, this is all about her virginity. And I think as well, the Armada gave her even more confidence in the choice that she'd made to remain unmarried. And it vindicated her as, as a soul queen, as she was referred to, as the virgin queen. It had actually been a masterstroke to decide not to marry, particularly not to marry a king of Spain uh, like her sister. And now she could really glory in her virgin state and her people started to as well. And why do you think, I mean, obviously it's just pure speculation, but wh why did she not get married? Do you think it was just because she didn't want to be ruled by a man? I think actually that was a big part of it. Um, Elizabeth had battled for the throne. She had had the most tortuous path to the mm. throne of nearly any other monarch in history. And so she's not going to give up any power, really. Not, not easily. And she knew that even as queen, as a queen regnant, she would be expected to give up a lot of her power to her husband. She famously said... I will have but one mistress here and no master. I think, though, as well, when you look back at the role models that had surrounded Elizabeth of, of marriage, of childbirth, there were no positive examples, no. really, from her childhood. Obviously, her mother, Anne Boleyn, had been executed when Elizabeth was not yet three. Um, her half-sister, Mary, had had a disastrous marriage on all fronts to the King of Spain. Her subjects hated it. The King of Spain didn't really like Mary. She had phantom pregnancies. Elizabeth had also seen, you know, various stepmothers come and go. Catherine Howard was executed. Catherine Parge died in childbirth. And it was said that she grew up with a genuine terror of marriage and childbirth. And you can't blame her. A modern day mm. psychologist would, would have a field day, I think, with Elizabeth. Um, but, you know, who could she have chosen without causing upset. Yeah, she could have married an Englishman, but that would have just divided her people and made the court even more faction-ridden than, than it already was. So I think it was the lesser of the, the evils just not to marry. Of course, the, the price for that was the succession. Yeah. Um, and, and that was obviously the, the major drawback uh, in not marrying. Hello, it's Artemis. For some time, we've been working with the visual historian Jordan Lloyd, and we've been telling you about his fascinating colorization work. Well, recently, Jordan has launched his new project. It's a website called Unseen Histories, which showcases a broad range of fascinating historical material. You can read feature-length pieces there about female fashion in the Victorian era, or beautifully illustrated extracts from books like Susan Denham Wade's A History of Seeing. For those of you who have enjoyed Jordan's colorization work in the past, there's a full range of remastered photographs from the archives of the Library of Congress. It's history for our times. Do have a look for yourself at unseenhistories.com. Well, I think that brilliantly takes us onto our third scene where we're going to very briefly meet the one man who I think was the love of her life and who she came closest to marrying, would you agree? I would absolutely agree. Robert Dudley, uh, Earl of Leicester, was definitely the love of Elizabeth's life. Um, theirs was a 50-year relationship where they first met when they were eight years old. 
Um, they had both seen adversity. Um, they were um, in the tower um, at various points in their, in their young lives. And uh, Robert Dudley had been the closest of Elizabeth's favourites from the very beginning of the reign. And their relationship even weathered the storms of him marrying somebody else in secret um, and of his first wife being found dead at the bottom of a flight of stairs and both he and Elizabeth were suspected of murdering her. It weathered all these storms and Dudley was with Elizabeth to the end. So he was actually with her at Tilbury, leading her horse uh, to uh, the middle of her troops where she gave that famous uh, speech um, and ensuring that he stayed by her side until the very last of the Armada ships had, had been safely seen off, um, off around the English coast towards Scotland. Um, and so, you know, he was, I think, undoubtedly Elizabeth's true love. Um, I'm, do you know, the question I, I'm asked more than any other when I give talks is, is did they or didn't mm. they? You know, was she yeah, really the yeah. Virgin Queen? I actually think she was the Virgin Queen, genuinely, but... I think there may have I think been it a, came quite close, probably. Yeah. I think it came a little bit close. It is, she had his chambers moved next to hers. He spent more time alone with her than anybody else. Yeah. But, you know, I don't think it ever went uh, too far. But by the time that the Armada had been defeated, poor old uh, Robert Dudley uh, was not in good health. Um, he, he was determined to stay with Elizabeth, as I said, until the threat had passed. Um, but then he sought refuge away from court um, and, and he went to Rycote in Oxfordshire, a home that he and Elizabeth uh, knew well. Uh, it was owned by Sir Henry and Lady Norris. They'd been guests there on a number of occasions um, and really Dudley was going there to, what he hoped was to, to recuperate. Um, but Elizabeth was desperately worried about him. She sent him medicines and she sent him letters, but unfortunately he, he would never return. And so the 4th of September is, um, and it is when he's on his deathbed and she, she obviously she wasn't with him and mm. they think that he died of malaria. Is that, is that right? Yes, that is, that is a, a theory. It's always really hard because there are diseases that were around in the Tudor times that are no longer around today. So you can only go on the sort of symptoms that are described. I think he was quite frail anyway. So if he caught something like a malarial infection, then that, that would have been... Very, very serious. Um, but it, yes, it was on the 4th of September uh, that poor old Dudley uh, died. But before he died, he wrote one last letter to his royal mistress. And I used to work at the National Archives, and I've since been back there so many times for research. And the letter still exists. And it's by far my favourite of the hundreds of thousands of documents in the National Archives. Um, so it's it's sort of fairly inconsequential. He's, he's thanking her for the medicine that she sent him. Um, and he refers to himself as your poor old servant. Now, the word poor, those two O's, he has um, sort of made into I's. Um, so with little eyebrows above each O because Elizabeth's uh, nickname for him was her eyes. So I, I just That's think it's so, so touching. touching. That, how so does he sweet. address her in the letter? So uh, he, he begins by saying, I most humbly beseech your majesty uh, to pardon your poor old servant, uh, to be bold in sending to know how my gracious lady doth. So even at this stage when you know he's dying, he, he wants to know how she is. Um, and... He needs that for reassurance. He said, he says, essentially, I need to know you're well, and then that will make me feel better. Sadly, he didn't recover. The letter was sent to Elizabeth. By the time she received it, uh, he was likely already dead. Um, but this is when it gets truly heartrending because Elizabeth was utterly, utterly heartbroken at the loss of uh, Robert Dudley. And for many years afterwards, if anybody even mentioned his name, her eyes would fill with tears. And... When she herself died in March 1603, they found among um, the possessions in a locked casket by her bedside um, that letter from Reichert that, that Robert Dudley oh. had written. And she has inscribed it, his last letter. And you can still see that um, if That's you so romantic, go to the National it? Archives. It's so romantic. And I also love the fact that it gives you a slight insight into Elizabeth's 
accent, the way she spoke, because people tended to write um, phonetically mm. or spell phonetically. And, and it's his last um, letter with A-R. <laughs> and you kind of think, maybe you can just imagine her saying that. <laughs> um, but yes, it's, it's a really... A really personal memento, and and it, it was more than just for show. This relationship, it's there was a lot of you know chivalrous code going on in Elizabeth's court with people professing love for uh, Gloriana and the Virgin Queen, and you tend to see it all as false. But when it came to Elizabeth and Dudley, I, I think their love was very very mm. real. And of course, it makes sense that someone who'd who'd had the childhood she had, which was just. I mean, extraordinary what she had to, you know, the amount of times when she was sort of nearly almost on the verge of being executed or certainly being, you know, in, in the tower or imprisoned or, um, you know, as a young child. I mean, it's just unthinkable now, isn't it? You know, to have to survive that kind of thing and your mother being um, executed and then your, the marriage being annulled and then she was a bastard. Then she was Ill- illegitimate and had no place. And it, I mean, it, yeah, it's no wonder that she... Um, was so good at dealing with the court and you know I mean, she really had a had a had an education in it didn't she as a child she absolutely did and I, I think you go one of two ways if you have a horrific childhood like that and um it it it, it makes you or breaks you mm. and, and in Elizabeth's case it absolutely made her it sort of chiseled her into this fearsome ruler and you compare her childhood to her greatest rival Mary Queen of Scots who was raised a pampered princess and and just raised to believe it was all easy and of course that ended very badly indeed for Mary and and she made a a bit of a disaster of being Queen of Scots and uh, she certainly made disastrous choices in her husband's Um, so actually horrific though Elizabeth's upbringing was I think it did her a big favour. I think it, it helped. It's very yeah, interesting it to her... contrast those those two. I hadn't thought about it like that. That's mm-hmm. really interesting. Yeah, definitely. I think it was to the good um, in terms of uh, Elizabeth's reign. You know, she she'd already had so much life experience yeah. by the time she became queen at the age of twenty five uh, that she knew what she was doing. Yeah, and she also had a very good education. Like um, we we should add, add that she in. did. She was um, and was incredibly intelligent. I mean, re- really so intelligent. intelligent. I mean. It, it's quite typical for royal offspring to be praised for their intellect, but in Elizabeth's she case, genuinely she really was. was. Yeah. yeah, she was the real yeah. deal. <laughs> so I think there's just one um, one question left to ask, and that is if you could have taken something from one of these three scenes and brought it back with you to the present. I don't know, maybe I can guess what it's going to be. What What would it be? <laughs> Well, you know, I did think about should I get a, the the medicine that Elizabeth sent to to Dudley, or should I go for perhaps some of the gold from one of the wrecked Armada ships? But actually, what I would choose was the plumed helmet that Elizabeth wore to deliver her Tilbury speech, because I think that just says it all yeah. about her genius for PR. I think that's a fantastic choice. Um, Thank you so much, Tracy Borman. Um, It's been an absolute joy to talk to you today. And I wish you all the best with your book. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure. That was me, Violet Moller, talking to Tracy Borman about her new book, Crown and Scepter, which is out now and available in all good bookshops. For more information and some lovely images, please head to our website, tttpodcast.com where you can also find the full Travels Through Time archive. I hope you enjoyed this episode as much as I did. Until next time, goodbye.